Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast. Tonight I am joined by two special guests, Peter Hammond, who I've had on before, uh, who's a uh, missionary in uh, South Africa, Rhodesia region, and uh, Robert William Brown, who was a member of the uh, Rhodesian Special Air Services during the Bush War. Thank you for joining me tonight, gentlemen. Good to be with you, Tom. Um, so, yeah, um, maybe I want to open up a little briefly how I found Rhodesia. The funny thing is the way I found Rhodesia was on YouTube. I found uh, Clem Follett first and then John Edmund, because I, I like to listen to folk music. Uh, and I just stumbled across these guys randomly. I'm like, these guys are great. Like, what's the context for what they're coming from? And, you know, they sung a lot about living in the country, the environment, the people, but also the struggles they had to go through during the 60s, 70s, during the Bush War. And I thought, okay, well, great. Where can we learn more about Rhodesia? Um, and I looked around, you both for military histories on the Bush War, and also just generic history of the country. Uh, most histories are unfortunately extremely biased uh, towards the more Marxist narrative. Um, and the accounts of what actually happened are not at all accurate to what people who were there on the ground would have said. Um, and so I thought it might be helpful to talk to people who were actually there, who lived there firsthand at various stages of its history, to sort of, in their own words, give an account of what it was really like and not what the global media, really ever since UDI had, had been saying about the country. But um, uh, Peter, why don't you uh, briefly sketch the history of Rhodesia from its initial settlement by the Rhodes uh, Group and up to UDI? Yes, well, it was a privilege to live in Rhodesia. My father was a hotel manager up in the uh, in Salisbury um, Fort, in Fort Victoria and Victoria Falls Hotel in Bulawayo. Uh, so I had the privilege of uh, being a young boy at school in Rhodesia. I was too young to serve in the army there. And that's where Rob Brown will come in. But I, I experienced it as a youngster and having it, seeing it through my parents' eyes. Rhodesia began in 1890 with the British South Africa group, which run the British South Africa company and British South Africa police. They bought a section of the country on um, a treaty with the chief or the king of the Matabili, uh, Lubangula, and so they, they gave him a gunboat on the Zambezi, a whole lot of rifles, masses of different things that he wanted, and uh, uh, he ceded to them a whole lot of his territory, uh, which basically was Mashonaland. And so 1890, the pioneer column went up, hoisted the Union Jack over what later became Salisbury, and uh, within about three years, they got unhappy about the fact that the black tribes that they were caring for, the Shona people, were being raided and murdered and captured as slaves by the Matabili. And the Matabili said, well, you can do what you want for the land, but the black people, they belong to us, we can do what we want for them. And uh, that led to the First War of 1893, and then there was a later one of 1896. And basically, during this time, the whole of Rhodesia came into its form of what later was called Southern Rhodesia. Cecil Rhodes, as a prospector, wanting to find more gold, he later took over northern Rhodesia, what uh, today is known as Zimbabwe, as Zambia. And so you had the Central African Republic came about after the Second World War, where northern Rhodesia, what today is Zambia, and southern Rhodesia, what today is Zimbabwe, was linked also to Nyasaland, what today is Malawi. And that Central African Republic was actually quite successful. Uh, they did the pioneers. Um, hydroelectric power plant of Kariba Dam, which was phenomenally successful, providing all electricity needs for this whole Central African area and still able to export. Uh, it, it, the country was just growing in leaps and bounds. And in the mentality and attitude of decolonialization and the Soviet Union promoting revolutions in Africa, uh, they started to promote a real violent uh, anti-establishment, rioting, terrorism situation, which led to the British government, instead of standing by the people, who after all had stood by them in the First and Second World War, Rhodesians had fought for the British when the British called, but now when we were under attack, the British government did a real backstabbing operation and basically torpedoed the whole Central African, um, uh, the Central African, what was it called? Federation, the Central African Federation, 
And as a result, they gave independence to a black Marxist, Kenneth Gohinda in Zambia, and to a one-party dictator, uh, Hastings Banda in Malawi, but they refused to give independence to Rhodesia, which had always been a self-governing, self-supporting, not a single pound or penny of British money was put into Rhodesia. Rhodesia was from day one running itself, providing its own security. So Rhodesia is quite unusual in the British Empire. It was never built up with British money or British manpower or British military. It was a private operation done with the blessing of Queen Victoria. Uh, they had a charter, uh, but Cecil Rhodes' private army, the British South Africa Police and his company, financed the whole thing. And Rhodesia was from 1923, self-governing, independent, basically like a dominion, uh, almost on the level of Canada. And so they were self-governing, running themselves, paying for their own bills. And suddenly these people to the north who had never run themselves, never paid for themselves, were given independence. And southern Rhodesia was not allowed to have independence because they had a white dominated government. So the whole story at that stage, you know, the narrative was bad whites and poor innocent black victims. So the narrative was that Rhodesia was a white minority government. Well, it was not really that. What it was, was a country with a qualified franchise. If you had educational qualifications or owned property, you could vote. It wasn't about whether you were white or black. It was a qualified franchise. But, of course, the British government and the United Nations and the troublemakers and organization of African unity, they didn't care about the facts. They just wanted the narrative that this was a, a white minority government. But at that stage, they were working towards 50-50 parity of 50 members of parliament white, 50 members of parliament black. And they were, that, that was the goal. But now the terrorists started to murder the black town councillors, the black mayors, the black members of parliament, and terrorize people who were voting, as in black people were voting in the elections, until the government became less and less and less multiracial and became a white minority government. But that wasn't their policy. That was the result of the terrorism and intimidation of the uh, terrorists who later, Mugabe, Zanu, and, uh, and Nkomo's Zapu. So what you saw was a well-run, efficient country with excellent race relations, the bread boss of Africa, exporting food, no famine, even during years of drought, nobody starved in Rhodesia, everything's working well, surrounded by chaos in countries that have had decolonialization. And then the British government determined to try and sabotage and declare illegitimate a government that had always minded its own business, had sent vast amounts of their men uh, out of all proportion to their numbers to fight for the British in the First and Second World War and the Malayan conflicts and so on. And so Rhodesia at a certain point said, this is unacceptable. And on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 1965, at the most hallowed hour of Armistice Day, which is in the British world, very sacred, because that's when they remember the end of the First World War, 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, uh, 1918. And so in 1965, deliberately choosing Armistice Day and hour, Rhodesia declared its independence. And the British government was more outraged by the timing of the independence than it were by the act of independence, because it was a clear slap in the face of the British government to remind them, we fought for you and you stabbing us in the back now that we're under attack by Soviet communism and communist supported terrorists who are murdering our farmers and our people, and, and this is unacceptable. So Rhodesia's independence in 1965, what was called unilateral declaration of independence, was in every way the same thing as what the United States did back in 1776, when you declared independence for the crown, that's what you celebrate on the 4th of July. The difference was you didn't have the United Nations <laughs> or the State Department around when you declared independence, the next thing we knew, we were declared a threat to world peace and Rhodesia was being sanctioned, couldn't take part in the Olympics, couldn't take part in the Paraplegics Olympics. I mean, how petty can you get? And so this little country of Rhodesia, population was only about 300,000 whites and 5 million blacks uh, uh, when I was there. And, uh, you know, how can this country, which had, what, about 40 helicopters and a total airborne capacity of 200 airborne soldiers, and this is called a threat to world peace. And we were being attacked and our teachers are carrying weapons and mothers had to be pushing prams at the shops carrying weapons and farmers were under attack. And, and we were called a threat to world peace. 
And the British, the Americans, the European Union, African Union, World Class Churches gathered together and supported the Soviet supported terrorists who were murdering our farmers and our missionaries. So that's really where Rob comes in uh, with the war. But uh, that takes you right up to 1965 and, and our independence. Well, yeah. Um, I do have a question for you, though, Peter. What was it like actually growing up as a, as a boy? in the country of Rhodesia? Absolutely tremendous. It was an adventure. It was like a paradise. I mean, for me, living in Rhodesia was just so much fun. There was wild animals everywhere. We could have wild animals as pets. It was just great. I was in Bulawayo, which is the second largest city, and I remember when the first uh, traffic lights came in, that was quite exciting. Um, uh, it was a small town, really. And uh, I could walk out of town, like on Saturday, I walked out to Kami Ruins, which was 14 miles. And my parents didn't know, they didn't care, and as long as I was home before the sunset, it was fine. And I saw wildebeest, I saw rhino, I saw giraffes. This wasn't at a game park, this is just out of the city limits. So the country was a wildlife paradise. And even though we were in a war, I felt safe, and uh, I could walk just about anywhere. It was a great, it was a wonderful time to, to be alive. It was a great place to be. We interacted with animals. One of the highlights of my year was when we did bushcraft uh, survival training. They would send us uh, as a whole class off to a game reserve and the game ranger would teach us how to track and anti-track and survive. And uh, you know, it's just wonderful. So I grew up there thinking this is the greatest place in the world. And I must say, I felt really sorry for these poor kids in Britain and America who must live such utterly boring lives in such boring countries. And I thought, wow, I don't know why everybody didn't want to grow up in Rhodesia. I mean, this is just like the greatest place on earth. And that's the way I felt about it. It was just, to me, I didn't see the tragedy or the war. Or the, I just saw the adventure and the fun and, uh, you know, lots of animals. Yeah, well, it's funny you bring up the animals because Rhodesia, beginning in the late 60s, became kind of the gold global standard for wildlife preservation. Um, I think it was in 1975, the Smith government passed a law, uh, a wildlife act that basically, to make a long story short, privatized uh, animal life in Rhodesia. Rather than seeing these animals as pests or threats that might eat your crops or trample your fences down, this, this act that Smith passed um, incentivize them to say, hey, look, you have a stake in this wildlife. You have a stake in preserving these beautiful creatures. And it worked, you know, for about 10 years until Mugabe got rid of it. And then you know, Mugabe, things started to go downhill everywhere. But is there anything you want to add maybe about uh, conservation and wildlife preservation in Rhodesia, Peter? I remember watching the films of Operation Noah when, when Kariba Dam was being pulled and they brought in the game rangers and the game rangers were rescuing the animals and getting them out there and, and you know, as the waters were rising, going and rescuing even the snakes and the monkeys from the trees and putting them in the boats and getting them off to shore. And I just looked at this thought, oh, you know, what a great thing to do. I'd love to be a game ranger. And uh, uh, when I went to Wanky Game Reserve and you'd see these herds of hundreds of elephants, it was just phenomenal. So uh, 1972, I also remember the Rhodesian government saying, we have 5 million people, we must plant 5 million trees this year. And they did. So during Rhodesia, there were so much deforestation. And this is the thing that amazed me. All your liberal, leftist, Greenpeace tree huggers, they say they care for the environment, but they don't. Because they destroy countries that care for the environment, like countries like Rhodesia and South Africa, and they support Marxist mass murdering thugs who destroy entire forests and drain entire seas like the the Caspian Sea and, and all that, just extraordinary. The Soviets, the Chinese, the Cubans, all the communist governments are the biggest ecological disaster and they support all the canned hunting, rhino poaching, you name it. So I'm wondering, where's your environmentalist outcry about the destruction of wildlife and forests under Mugabe, who the socialists work so hard to put in power? Unfortunately, it's non-existent. Um... But uh, uh, Robert, now you, uh, yeah. I guess I got three questions to start off with. Uh, what was your profession prior to joining post UDI Rhodesia? Um, what got you interested um, in joining 
uh, the Rhodesian Armed Forces. And I guess thirdly, what was it like being out in the bush? Okay. Um, I, I, uh, firstly, um, I'm a soldier by profession. That is my chosen profession. That's what I chose to become at a very early age. Um, the Rhodesian conflict wasn't my first conflict. Um, and I, I, I deliberately went to Rhodesia uh, to fight as a soldier. Um, prior to joining the Rhodesian Special Air Service, I'd already uh, already been in two conflicts. Um, when I uh, decided to go to Rhodesia, it uh, in no way was a, uh, a, a racial war, although I, I have to be perfectly candid, I do have my preferences with the people I associate with. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I was a professional soldier and that's why I ended up in Rhodesia. It's, it's what I did. Uh, um, and to some extent, it's what I still do when the opportunity arises. So uh, does that answer your question? That answers uh, how you how you uh, got interested in Rhodesia. But how did you decide to join the special air services? There were other uh, uh, stellar in, uh, organizations like the KAR, the RLI, the Sulu Scouts. Oh yeah. Um, what 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 about the uh, SAS? Uh, attracted you over these other uh, organizations? Um, I, I, I became a special forces soldier originally when I was about 17 uh, in the Australian Army. Um, I, uh, I did selection for um, a small unit called uh, Two Command, uh, which uh, was the Australian Army, Australian Infantry. Um, today in Australia, uh, they have a combined special forces, which includes the uh, Australian Special Air Service, uh, commando companies, and um, also special signal units and things like that. Um, but I, I did my first selection when I probably was about 17, um, and I uh, joined two commando. Um, after, after a short while there, um, I went to uh, Southeast Asia as a civilian soldier and contracted to a, a small country called Laos. Um, uh, most, of, most of what happened in Laos up until um, I think 2008 was still, uh, still regarded as classified by the Americans. Uh, so there's not a lot of information came out of there. But I, I spent about three and a half months there um, and then uh, I went through to the United Kingdom and I joined the uh, British Parachute Regiment and I was uh, a member of um, uh, Two Para, 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment and I did um, three tours of duty in Northern Ireland and I must be honest, having coming from a warm climate in Australia, uh, three years in the British Parachute Regiment was not pleasant, um, especially uh, in Northern Ireland, which can be extremely cold and very, very wet. So after I finished my contract, I thought time for warm weather soldiering. So um, I, I ended up in Rhodesia. Actually, how I actually ended up in Rhodesia was, was quite strange. I, I was in London and they were having a demonstration outside what used to be Rhodesia House. And um, there was a very large group of people demonstrating against Rhodesia. And on the other side of the road was a very, very small group of people who were pro-Rhodesia, um, kind of making their voice heard in support of Rhodesia. And I looked at this and I thought, it must be pretty bad there because you have all these people who are anti and don't really know what's going on. And I walked across the other side of the road to this small group of people and I stood talking to somebody there and in the space of a few minutes, uh, they explained the situation to me. And I, I suppose it's just something inherent in, I don't know, in, in my country or, or maybe in 
in uh, the Western world, um, a sense of fairness um, that such a small group of people were being harassed and shouted down by this larger group of people. And don't forget, I've spoken to both sides. It wasn't a matter of, I walked up to somebody and said, hey, listen, I'm on your side, tell me all about it. Uh, I went over to the other side first because I didn't know what it was about. What is the problem? And they told me, oh, gee, how wicked these people were. I looked across the street and I thought, that little group of people, compared to your little group of people, there's an imbalance here somewhere. And that's where I went and spoke to them. And, and the guy actually asked that I was from a parachute regiment. He said, why don't you go there? They're crying out for soldiers. And I walked away and I thought about it. And that's how I eventually ended up there. I went into special, uh, special air service because that's what I was trying to do. Uh, I, I went, um, of course, I had to do their selection again. Um, but that's the same as when I went into the British Army, I had to do their selection again. So I became a badge member and uh, I, I went as an operator. And, and they, in my mind, I think they really deserved help. Out of all the conflicts I've been in, and I've been in quite a few, this would be a conflict, I would say, that was genuinely fighting a defensive war. Uh, from my experience, most wars are started by um, uh, you, you, by by the money powers of the world, by the oligarchy, um, because they want something that somebody else has, or it's uh, part of their forum, or they they make treaties with people purely to um, uh, plunder the country of, of whatever wealth he's got um, or, or, to, or to militarize them. Uh, that, that's how most wars start. If somebody wants something that somebody else has. Um, from my experience in Rhodesia, their war started because somebody wanted what they had, but their response was purely a defensive war for survival. Um, and with hindsight, we now know that um, it, it, it was for their survival because they no longer survived. Uh, there are no more Rhodesians once this generation or, or my generation is gone. So um, why a special air service? I was trained to do it, and um, I found it easy. I, I, I personally find soldiering easy. Uh, the reason I went through so many different armies and so many different places because I'm not a peacetime soldier. I find peacetime soldiering incredibly boring and frustrating. So that's that's one of the reasons I ended up uh, in Rhodesia. Before I got down to Rhodesia and joined the Special Air Service, I actually travelled over land. So I had a good a good idea of what Africa was going to be like should something happen in Rhodesia. And one of the most gruesome stories I actually heard was, and, and turned my head, and uh, I don't have the actual references for this story, and people often say, well, if you, if you can't reference something, it's just a matter of opinion. But this is not a matter of opinion. This, is, this was reported in a French newspaper uh, and, and later on translated into English. And it was, at that time, there was a lot of conflict on the African continent. And uh, one of those conflicts was in Angola, and Angola was a very old war. And there was a small timber village, and there was probably about 45, upwards of maybe 70 people living in that village, and they worked for the timber company. And the uh, terrorists at that time decided they would attack that village. And the men in the village got um, intelligence as to where they were moving. So all the men in the village congregated and moved five, about five kilometers outside of town to engage uh, the terrorist group that was coming in to the village, to attack the village. 
and when I say village, it wasn't mud huts. It was a, a Portuguese village. It was it was, it was a proper uh, brick and mortar village with a made road. But unfortunately, when the uh, when the men in the village were mobilised, they used a radio, and the terrorists advancing on the village also had a radio, and they heard that the men were coming five kilometres out to engage them. So what they did is they flanked, they did a flanking movement on the town. And in the town, there was only women and children left. And they occupied the town. Uh, they were extremely brutal. And uh, this is what tripped my switch more than anything. They occupied the town and beat the people and uh, actually used pangas and machetes on them to chop them up. They then strapped them to timber and ran them lengthwise through the... Now that may really kind of be your listeners. This is a reality. This happened. And when that story was related to me and I eventually proved that it was correct, that it did actually happen. It was reported by a French journalist. I thought to myself, something has to be done. Now, I'm not going to save the world, but I believe that people make a difference. And if one person can stand up and make an effort, then it means a lot of people stand up and make an effort. So that's, that's actually why I went to Rhodesia. It was, I'd already seen communism. I'd seen it in, in Laos, north of Pien, uh, you know, when the Laotian army was fighting the uh, Papat Lao. Um, I'd seen a heavy, heavy communist influence in, amongst the IRA um, in New Ireland. Um, uh, we uh, shot a sniper off the roof, and when we got to him, he was dressed like they dress in the movies nowadays. He was all dressed in black. He had collapsible rifle, and the special branch traced him back, and he was from Eastern Europe. So there was, uh, even though the IRA in Ireland was a tradition, um, terrorist revolutionary group, although they were originally a proper army, the IRA was a proper army, um, they did have a heavy communist presence. So I already knew the results of communism, and uh, for my money, I just felt that I had to get involved and do something. Very interesting. Kind of, your story kind of reminds me of the, uh, the song by Warren Zavon, Roland the Headless Thompson Gunner. I don't know if you guys have heard that song. It was uh, from the 70s, I think. And, uh, yeah, Roland, he was, uh, I think, a Swede or Norwegian. Uh, he goes down to Africa to, to basically fight against these terrorist guys. Then he gets betrayed by his his teammates who get paid off by the U.S. government. But um, now, in the Special Air Services, were you in Operation Dingo at Chimoya? Um. I, I I wasn't involved in the actual operation. I did. Okay, uh, let me explain. The role of the special air service is uh, there are mostly a reconnaissance group of people. They they go in and collect information. Um, their primary role would be. Um, they also work with indigenous people, but in that particular theatre, they didn't so much. In fact, they didn't at all. It was a completely uh, European unit. Um, we did a lot of reconnaissance work. Uh, we did a lot of ambushing. We did a lot of fun. Uh, um, we did do some camps attack. I got to be honest. I don't recognise that name. Um, I, I don't. I don't recall that name. But. Uh, I did a lot of recce work around Chamoya. Did recce work around Espanol Vera. Uh, did a lot of work and then 
bushing inside uh, inside um, in, inside uh, Mozambique. Okay. Um, yeah, Operation Dingo was November of '77, and uh, something like 200 Rhodesian forces routed 10,000 terrorist forces. It was one of the most lopsided engagements of modern history. Um, uh, yeah, I remember. I remember it now. They, they. Uh, uh, that's one of the places where a chopper went down and they couldn't get the people back, so they they fragged it. They they um, mm. put Frantan on it and nampal them on it, so that they couldn't get the bodies. I, I I remember that. I did not take part in that. No. Okay. Um. What would uh, an average say sweep have looked like, or or an average mission for a special air service in Rhodesia? An average, sorry. Well, maybe not average, but routine. Let me put it that way. What what was a mission like? Oh, oh, I see. What what was our mission? Okay. Um. All right. Let's have a look at. Uh, let's let's have a look, and I'll give you a practical example of uh, one mission that we did, which is successful. Um, a group, uh, a large group of terrorists had come down from Mozambique. And they entered Rhodesia, um, and what they did is they created a bit of mayhem amongst the farmers, killed quite a few farmers, and that kind of thing. Now, we used to operate externally quite a lot, okay? Uh, we didn't wear Rhodesian uniforms. We used to wear whatever kind of garments we could get, okay? Any kind of uniform at all. Uh, if we were working external, we would use foreign weapons, AKs, RPGs, RPDs. All right. Um, on this occasion, I was I was already in the bush, and uh, um, I was with a four-man patrol. Because uh, the troop I was in was never under it was never up to full strength, and all they. Um, created a hybrid called One Rhodesia Regiment, and I was in Sequel, which at that time was still part of 22 Special Air Service. When I say part of special uh, 22 Special Air Service in Britain, they were all done. Let me explain that. When the, when the regiment would muster on parade for any particular reason, which the SAS doesn't do a great deal of, because it doesn't like parades. Um, when 22 SAS mustered, they A troop, D troop, B troop, okay? And they would always leave a vacant spot when they mustered for C troop, Special Air Service, which was Rhodesia, all right? Later on in Rhodesian history, they then formed one Rhodesian regiment, uh, and there was some controversy about that because Hereford never recognised them. But to go back to the operational procedure, um, I was uh, already part of the four-man team inside Mozambique. Uh, we got a signal to uh, to join up with another two four-man teams, making 12 men. And what had happened is these terrorists had come in, they'd slayed a lot of people, they'd burnt a lot of farms, um, and, and uh, tortured and mutilated quite a lot of locals. Then what they did is they did a bout turn, ran back across the border, and they were working their way back up north, uh, thinking we couldn't get them. From that particular time, um, the three call signs came together, and we were ordered to stash our AKs and we they bought in and gave us um, Rhodesian firearm, okay, which was uh, um, similar to the Belgian FN, R1 FN, call it what you will, okay. Uh, we went into ambush. My ambush lasted three days. We sat in ambush three days. Um, our orders were to uh, eliminate all the terrorists uh, no prisoners, nothing. And what we were meant to do is we weren't meant to clean up. We were meant to leave physical evidence to know that the, to know let them know that the Rhodesians had tracked them, traced them, and found them. And um, that group 
wasn't ambushed. That group was ambushed multiple times and none of them got back at all. They took them out. Um, the ambush lasted, uh, my ambush lasted three days. Um, uh, we opened the ambush um, early afternoon. Um, we had 100% kill rate of the people who walked into the ambush. Uh, we moved up on the high ground because there was a lot of them. They, they moved in, in groups, you know, uh, blocks. It just wasn't one long line. So the group that moved into our ambush area, and then they had further back, probably about kilometres down the track, another group, and then another group. Uh, when we moved up onto the high ground, we estimated there must have been something like about two, 200 of them waiting to organise themselves to put in a counter-attack. But by that time, we had top cover. We had a gunship up there and a couple of um, troopers up there. Uh, so they just cut and run. Um, but that wasn't the end of the story because that track, they had to use that track to get up north. So all we did is we just kept uh, doing a, um, a 360 around um, and uh, moved the ambush up the track, up the track. And as I say, that was, um, that was a pretty successful ambush. Um, most of our ambushes were successful. We had what they call an incredibly high kill rate. I don't mean they killed a lot of us. I mean, in relation to our numbers, we killed an awful lot of them. Um, and I know killing people is not the correct political term, uh, but um, that's the way it is. Um, we were very, very successful as, as a unit. But that's, um, that's uh, just one very successful ambush. Um, operational procedure, uh, without going into too much detail, we just get given an order, um, get given a war, then uh, do a briefing, uh, assemble our kit, and we'd have various ways of insertion, um, uh, parachute in, heli born in, or um, we would even drive trucks and um, we'd come off the back of a truck because in the bush, um, a motor, uh, the motor noise of a truck, especially at night, travels far, 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 far. So if we motor in on a vehicle um, and they were in the bush, they, they would hear it and they would, they would move away. So what we used to do is we used to drive the vehicles and they would never stop. And we just, uh, you know, when they, when they hit an incline and had to gear down so they went slowly, the troops would come off the back and the truck would keep on going. And, of course, uh, anybody listening would hear the trucks go, 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 go and disappear. And then we'd, we'd carry on with our hop. We'd, we'd sit for the night and then carry on hop in the morning. Um, so there was that. And then... Um, uh, a couple of camp attacks. Um, what you've got to understand is that um, the people we were fighting were not really that good. They were brutal. They were very vicious and brutal. And, and um, you know, you don't have to be very good to uh, to um, to attack a farmhouse where it's got probably a couple of people in there, a couple of women and kids and a farmer. Uh, you don't have to be very good to do that. You've just got to be very brutal and have a lot of people on your side. Um, so, um, in fact, uh, I, I had a, a, a friend of mine named... Um, one of the first ambushes I did with him, um, we did an ambush, and uh, uh, it's hard to explain, but Afrikaans people, you know, rural Afrikaans people, normally they're very big. They're, 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 they're very, very large, very big, okay. Or maybe I'm very small, and they just look very big. But by and large, Afrikaans people, the, the real Buddha Afrikaner, he, he, he's large. He's, he's a big man. And I remember doing an ambush with a guy called Bud. And 
But you must understand that I, I was British trained and Australian trained, and we had certain certain things you do and certain things you don't do. So we hit this ambush, uh, you know, we, we, we hit them in this ambush, and I saw them running down the track with a machine gun, a GPMG machine, and he was firing it from the shoulder. And after it all calmed down, I said to him, I said, what are you doing, Bert? I said, you, you're going to get killed. All he had to do was stop running, turn around, and that would have been on you. And his reply to me, he says, Rob, to catch him and shoot him, you've really got to run. Because when they heard that first bullet go off, boy, they do run. And I'll tell you now, these guys really trick it. When, when they get into an ambush or something, or when they know there's soldiers around there, I have never seen them run so fast. These people run when they have no legs. And I'm deadly serious. Uh, it, it may not be comical to other people, but I've actually seen it, and it is real. They are not brave people. Um, they, they are just brutal. They are just brutal people. And I have, I have witnessed that all over Africa. They're brutal to their own people, and they're brutal to anybody that they oppose. Um, um, I have a any, question. Um, what uh, were you ever a part of a operation that involved the fire force method? And if so, would you explain what that is? Okay, fire force was mostly R and I, and um. Okay, let me let me explain the two different types of soldiering without going into too much operational procedure. Um, special Air Service, we would go on a patrol, which and we were going to the bush. And I will say, when I mean going to the bush or the jungle, call it what you will. Okay, I don't mean we'd set up a base camp and then send out patrols. We would actually physically going to the bush for three weeks, four weeks, six weeks. And in that period of time, we would be resupplied. So we wouldn't come back out. And what we would do is we'd either do uh, ambushing, continuous ambushing, uh, continuous um, uh, wreckings to find camps and things like that. All right. So we would be inserted. Now, when we get inserted, we were carrying a tremendous amount of weight on our back, all right? Um, and we would carry anything from claymores to, to um, uh, AP mines, anti-vehicle mines, uh, for whatever other countries. Of course, we work mostly outside of Rhodesia, okay? So we'd be inserted into the bush, all right, with all our equipment, to sustain us for however long we'd have to be there. And if we were going to be there an extended period of time, then what we would do, is we would get air resupply. And the airplane would come over probably night, last light, et cetera, et cetera, and dump, and then we'd resupply and carry on with the task we had. So we weren't coming in and out. Now, fire force, what would happen is they would establish a base uh, inside Rhodesia, because they worked internally, except on very rare occasions when we didn't have enough people to do it, we'd use our troops. They would establish a forward base, and normally it would have helicopter pads. They'd, they'd make a landing pads um, uh, uh, in the base, okay, and they would have probably one or two or three choppers. And then they'd have teams. Now, the choppers they were using then were Alouettes, which was an ideal um, helicopter for that environment because of, because of the heat. And they only take about four or five people, okay? So they would have four sticks or three sticks. They'd have four people to a stick, five people to a stick and they'd have three helicopters. And then what would happen is you'd get, you'd get a team 
um, they would be fed intelligence. And then you'd get an OP or they would receive information that a group of terrorists had hit a farm or a group of terrorists were at a certain location or they had been seen or an incident had taken place. And then what would happen is, based on that intelligence, they would, for want of another word, scramble the stick and they would jump in the chopper and they would be inserted by a helicopter. Normally, what would happen is they would get, they would put a tracker team on the ground and the, the tracker team would pick up the tracks, okay? Then they would bring a team in and do probably um, uh, a 360 around to pick up the spore in the front. And, and then they'd insert a couple of sticks uh, and they would track in to the actual content. So they, they, they were very, uh, very light and very fast. Um, you'll see photos of guys where they, they're, they're wearing khakis or running shoes and they had shorts on. And basically all they would carry, they would carry their water and they would carry ammunition and they'd be inserted in, they'd track into the contact, uh, hit the gooks or the turds, okay, and then they would break and run. And then what they would do is they'd put a, a, a combat tracker team onto the tracks, the combat tracker team would track it again and they'd get a pretty idea, good idea of which way they're, because of the, uh, uh, you know, the topography and, and how the ground lay. Then what they'd do is do their, um, they circle around, pick up the spore. If they couldn't find spore, they knew they were in somewhere in that area because they they practically done a big big circle around uh, the the tracks. And if they at the far end and there's no tracks, then they know they're still inside. So um, RLI Fire Force was very rapid deployment, uh, deployed on incidents that took place or information that was given. And um, if it was a really heavy firefight, what, what the choppers would do, the choppers would put them down there and they'd go back and they'd get uh, a couple of other sticks and put them in as well. So very fast, very fluid, and um, pretty much every, every contact they had was, um, was um, a followed through to a final conclusion, a positive conclusion. So different kind of soldiering, um, you, you know. Um, uh, uh, special air service would uh, would go and uh, we would go and we would sit and uh, I identify um, uh, a, a track or uh, 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 the way they would move where we're moving from and, and then what we do is uh, we would um, put it in an ambush and sometimes very rarely in Rhodesia, but uh, occasionally you do a thing called shoot and scoot. You just blitz them, just uh, engage them, kill them, leave them, and, and, and uh, disappear and go somewhere else. Um, in Rhodesia, um, most times what we do is if we, um, if we hit them and contacted them, um, we would secure the area and then they would bring in a special branch and we'd tag them and bag them and they'd take them back to find out who they were and, and where they're from. All right. Um, now, Peter, now, how old were you when the... Uh, now, from what I understand of the Bush War is that it wasn't really until the, the 70s, the mid-70s, that the terrorists were well-equipped enough and in sufficient numbers to make the people on the home front begin to feel it. So how old were you when the terrorist threat became really serious and how did that change your life growing up in Rhodesia? I remember 1972, I was 12 years old. I was in the, um, uh, in the school in Bulawayo and the story started to come out about the massive increase of terrorist attacks and Operation Hurricane, which my elder brother later uh, was involved in on his national service. So uh, the way it changed our lives was just the fact that the school teachers carried rifles or machine guns when we went on school outings and 
when we went, for example, into near Lake Carl District, uh, the Mushendike um, Game Reserve, the game rangers, well, the game rangers would always be carrying uh, bolt action rifles around uh, anyway. Um, but we noticed later on, from 1972 on, the game rangers started to carry R1 rifles like the FN um, 7.62. So they started a box fed semi automatic weapon instead of their old bolt action. So I could see the game rangers started to up their, their um, alertness. Uh, we just had to be more alert. And when we were visiting a farm, the basic rules were you did not switch on the lights without closing the curtains. You did not go out the front door without switching off the lights. And then sandbags start to build up outside the farm windows. And uh, in the city, we were not affected much. It was the people in the countryside. And if you were traveling, like when we were going up to Victoria Falls or going out uh, to Antali, then on the road, you'd be alert. And towards the end, we saw they were getting convoys that you couldn't travel between towns unless you're traveling in a convoy with some kind of um, lead vehicle and often just a police a pickup truck with uh, a 5 Browning or even a 3 Browning in the back for some poor chap standing up there with a helmet and a flak jacket and he's he's the escort. Um, uh, very homegrown. Uh, it, it wasn't the sort of way the Americans would have done it, but um, the Rhodesians just knuckled down. I, I don't think that we saw it as much of a problem. I just saw it as an adventure. Uh, you know, at that age, a youngster, you don't really understand that there's people suffering and all this. It, it just seems all very adventurous and exciting. Yeah. Um, Robert, what, what was your experience with the Rhodesian people when you were on deployment there? What would you, what would you, what would you say about the actual people that you met, you worked with, civilian soldiers? Well, what was your view of the Rhodesian people? <coughs> okay. Um, what you have to remember is that um, when I went to Rhodesia, I, I, w I was an absolute perfect heathen. I, I really was. And it, it was in Rhodesia that I became a Christian. And, and um, hear the cliche, um, found a Lord. Okay. Um, so m my perceptions now of the Rhodesians looking back was different to my perceptions of the Rhodesians at that time. All right. Um, I, I found the Rhodesians incredibly, incredibly nice people, um, exceptionally polite, okay, very oldie worldy, right. But having said that, I also found that they were incredibly, incredibly immoral people. Now, you must understand, when I went to Rhodesia, I was a soldier, and I was not a Christian person, and I was part of that lifestyle, a moral lifestyle, okay. Um, I, incredibly, incredibly loose, incredibly immoral, but very, very nice and very pleasant people. Um, I was the majority of the Rhodesian people, I'm talking white Rhodesian people now, okay. Um, incredibly well educated. Their schooling system was absolutely brilliant. I mean, it really was. Um, and they were taught from a very early age uh, to be, um, how would you explain it? They were taught from a very early age to, to manage, control, um, and, and be in charge of um, uh, the, the things that surrounded them. Um, and, and this came to the fore, I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, an example. You would have, you would have, say, a 17 or 18 year old Rhodesian who was a Lance Corporal, or he might just be a senior soldier, all right? And he would be in charge of probably three or four people, or maybe half a dozen people. And if they got into a contact, that young soldier would be doing the job of a platoon commander. He would be organizing the men on the ground. He would be calling in airstrikes. And when I say airstrikes, I don't mean just gunships. He would be calling in hunter jets and vamp jets 
to dump what they call fran, which was really napalm. You call it a napalm in, in, in America. Okay, so you'd have this 17-year-old kid who would be, for one another word, in a, a very responsible leadership position. And the only reason he would be successful in that position because the Rhodesians were very, very well educated. They had a tremendous schooling system. They really did. Um, so that that was uh, quite quite incredible to watch. I, you must understand that I'd soldiered with the British in the uh, British Parachute Regiment. Um, you know, and, and, and my lieutenant in the British Parachute Regiment was Sandhurst trained. I would not have allowed that man to be left alone with a box of matches or a sharp knife. He worried me, okay? I was just thankful that I had a very good sergeant. Okay. Uh, but you had these kids fresh out of school who, who took positions of authority and did very, very well. And the other thing that I remember uh, about um, Rhodesian people, uh, and this is how they were brought up. Um, when I first came out of hospital after being very badly wounded the first, I was on crutches um, and I was hobbling uh, along this path. And right into all me were two young guys. They, they could have only been uh, 12, 13 at the most, okay? And the scoring system in Rhodesia, you had to wear a school uniform. And, uh, you know, it, 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 a reasonably smart uniform. And these two youngsters were riding along and they were getting closer and closer. And I was, here I do I hobble to the side? Do I stand my ground and stand a chance of getting, what do I do? Yeah. And they got about four meters away from me. They stopped their bicycles. As I got closer, they both took off their hats, stood to one side, and I said, good morning, sir, how are you? And you know something? That made it all worth it because later on when I got better, I went back on arms. And that's the kind of people they were and that's how they were that's how they were uh, uh, educated. A, a, a strong family system, a strong sense of belonging, strong sense of culture. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, yeah, I, I, I like them. I, I really, if people say to me, was it worth it? I say yes, it was. Okay. Um, okay. Now, uh, Peter, what was it like? after the fall of the Smith regime, the, the Smith government? Yes, well, we didn't see him as a regime at all. He was a real popular leader of the people. You know, Ian Smith was was a, a leader we could respect. Uh, I remember I was 14 years old and I was told that the Prime Minister is coming to the Bulawayo Club, which my dad was running. So I was wanting to see a real live head of state, so to speak, and uh, uh, coming in, I was expecting an entourage, you know, you, you see the sort of things the Queen's got. Well, here comes this battered up Peugeot 404 down the road, uh, down 8th Avenue, parks in front of the Bulawayo Club. He gets out, it's plainly the Prime Minister, I, I, reckon, I mean, we've seen his picture how many times, and there's not a driver, there's not an aide de camp, there's not a policeman, there's not a bodyguard, there's not a traffic policeman sight. The Prime Minister of the country, in the middle of the war, is driving on his own, and he gets out and he smiled at me, stroked my cat on the wall, walked to the Bulawayo Club, and I, I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, this this is a real leader. Well, later on, I got to meet him, and in the last 20 years of his life, I, I got to meet Ian Smith uh, regularly and had lunch and tea and supper with him and interviewed him on radio, and it, it was really great. And uh, it started out with him calling me. He heard that there were some extradisions doing some crazy things in Mozambique, and he he summoned me to his daughter's home in Half Bay, not far from Cape Town, and um, made me tea with his Rhodesian Ridgebacks lying on <laughs> on the carpet in front of him, and uh, asked me to explain what on earth we were up to. And uh, before I knew it, he's leaning over the maps and he's explaining to me how to infiltrate and exfiltrate Mozambique safely, and how to avoid the patrols, and I'm thinking, what does a Prime Minister know about this? But only later did I remember 
Well, of course, he is a Spitfire pilot in the Royal Air Force throughout the whole six years of the Second World War. He was shot down twice, uh, crashed in North Africa, shot down over Italy. Um, and, you know, you need nerves of steel to bail out of a Spitfire because he explained the procedure when he got shot up. He had to flip the plane upside down, release the canopy, unbuckle his seatbelt so he'd fall upside down free of the plane. And once free, he could pull his ripcord. I mean, it's quite a procedure. And, of course, they weren't able to practice that. They just had to know what to do and do dry runs. But, you know, when he had to do it for real, his life depended. And he spent five months fighting with the partisans behind enemy lines. And then, of course, as Rhodesia's prime minister, he would have had people like General Walls, uh, uh, maybe Reed Daly, giving him briefings. And uh, so he would have known a few things about Mozambique. And so I, I realized what an unusual man. And I asked him, um, you know, I said, I saw you outside the Bolero Club in 1974 and you didn't have an escort. And just a couple of years ago, I was in Harare and along comes eight motorbike outriders, uh, several police vehicles, uh, a couple of armored um, Mercedes Benzes uh, with tinted windows. You don't know which one Mugabe's in, uh, a truckload of gooks with rocket launchers behind. And uh, every vehicle's got to stop on both sides of the road. And this is the normal procedure for Robert Mugabe, the liberator, the popular leader of the people, traveling around town, he's got to have all these people around. Well, Ian Smith's meant to be the most hated man in Africa, and he had no security, including when I met him. He laughed, and so I asked him why he didn't have security, and he said, you know, I survived the Second World War. What do I need to be worried about? I'm a Presbyterian. Uh, we fear God. <laughs> so he just had a very offhand comment, and uh, I probed him a bit more, and uh, he uh, said, you know, um, when I was prime minister, I would regularly kick everyone out of independence. That's the prime minister's residence. There wasn't a guard at the gates. There wasn't a cook in the kitchen. He kicked everyone out. He didn't want anyone fussing around him. And that's the kind of leader he was. And he would break his own country's laws, getting into a, a car to drive to his farm in the center of the country uh, near uh, uh, Grillo. And uh, he wouldn't even have an escort with him. He didn't even, he didn't even wait for the convoy, which was the law actually at that time. So he said he was actually breaking his own laws. And that, uh, that's the kind of man he was, fearless. And so Ian Smith, um, what, what, a, what a principled person, one of the very, very, very few leaders, political leaders I've ever met that was a man of his word. He said what he meant and he meant what he said. Um, and uh, my only criticism of Ian Smith was that he is too much of a gentleman. So at one interview uh, on radio, I said, Mr. Smith, why are you not perhaps too much of a gentleman? I said, uh, when the British were offering you independence with these various proposals, the fearless talks, the tiger talks at Gibraltar and so on, why didn't you just accept it? And then when you got home after you got independence, have a referendum and then do what the Rhodesian people wanted or what you knew was right. And a shock came over his face, and he pulled himself up to his full height, and he's a tall man. And he looked at me with absolute shock and disdain. He said, we couldn't have done that. That wouldn't have been honest. What kind of example would that have been to the Africans? We couldn't build a Dijon a lie. And that's my main complaint about Ian Smith. He's a great man, but he was dealing with backstabbing, duplicitous, British Foreign Office characters, and uh, I think he should have been a little less of a gentleman. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, he is dealing with very, very dishonest people. And um, and yet, uh, he he tried to be honorable. And I don't know that you can be honorable when you're dealing with such disgusting uh, representatives of humanity. Uh, so, uh, I, Ian Smith's a hero of ours, but that doesn't mean I agree with everything he did or decided. <laughs> Uh, but but he was he was a man of integrity and one can only respect him for that. So after after 1980, when uh, well of course he handed over in 1979 to um, the the leader of the moderate black majority as they called him, uh, Bishop Abel Mazarewa. But then Abel Mazarewa got fooled into handing over to the British, and the British brought in a grandson of uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, Lord Soames was a real backstabbing, lying, duplicitous, treacherous <laughs> character. And uh, he sold the country down the river. And the Lancaster House Agreement was just a scrappy piece of paper because while the, uh, 
this is the problem. Ian Smith was probably too intelligent for them to cheat, but they got him to hand over to uh, Muzarewa, and Muzarewa, they could twist his mind, and before he knew it, he was trusting the British, and they were lying to him morning, noon, and night. So that Lord Soames really had not believed in this. And the next thing you know is that they actually sold him out, and he hands over to the British, the British hand over to the terrorists who are violating the agreement by, they meant to be confined to barracks, they're not doing that. And at the end of it, this is what happened. Uh, it wasn't that Ian Smith handed over to Mugabe, it's that Ian Smith handed over to Black Majority Leader, who was con to hand over to the British, who then handed over to, it's like whoever threw the Tsar of Russia, the Duma of Russia, handed over, um, really, and next thing you knew is the Bolsheviks overthrew the elected parliament of, of Russia. It wasn't that the Bolsheviks overthrew the Tsar, it's that the Tsar was was forced to abdicate by the parliament, and the parliament was overthrown by the revolution. And it's these middle steps that many people miss. And then, so as not to confuse people with the facts, a modern narrative comes out, which kind of, well, let's not confuse people with what really happened. Let's tell them what fits in with the Hollywood narrative. And um, uh, before you know it, they have this bad Ian Smith and this wonderful Mugabe, but obviously that's an inversion of the truth. Yeah, well, we're nearing the end of the time. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, before we leave out on a little of a lighthearted note, uh, what are your favorite John Edmonds songs? I have to think, Robert, you probably listened to some of those on the bush. John Edmonds. Who is John Edmonds? I don't know. Oh, wow. Oh, I was John mistaken. Edmonds. I'm sorry. Oh, you, you'd know the songs. For we all Rhodesians, we were I, quite through thick then. Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> let, let me just clarify something, okay? And, and I, I try to clarify this uh, often, okay? Um, I, I don't, um, uh, I'm, I'm not a television person. I don't watch television. I don't watch war movies. I don't read war books. And um, if this person is singing some kind of um, giddy up song to get people kind of, uh, uh, you know, emotional and sweaty about something. I probably wouldn't even know what he sings. I, I, I'm, I know I sound very boring, but uh, that's the way it is. Um, <laughs> I don't know who John Edmund is. Mm. <laughs> and I, th I think you said yours was uh, Rhodesians Never Die. Was that your favorite, Peter? Yes. Um, for we all Rhodesians, we all fight through thick and thin. There's another one he's saying that the, uh, the first name in Rhodesians is Rhodes, but the last word in Rhodesian is Ian. And uh, he had a lot of good songs. We, I must yeah. say, um, as youngsters, we, we liked Clem Follett and, uh, and John Edmund's songs very much. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining me tonight, gentlemen. This is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast, signing off.